This is a lightly smoked circuit breaker sent by Jordan of Artisan Electrics. Now, he's already made a video where he took this out of the charging pillar, so I shall link to that in the description down below, and you can take a look at the history of how I ended up this breaker. So this is out of a Rolex charging pillar, and I've looked at a Rolex one before, and there's a sort of rumour going around that Rolex uh, pillars, the circuit breakers, are prone to burning up in them. I wonder if that's just down to the fact that Rolex make quite a lot of outdoor charging pillars. They've been in the business for a long time before uh, the electric vehicles came along, I'm pretty sure. And in this one, the problem was that the contacts had not mated perfectly squarely, so that if... I could emulate it with this. Instead of the flat square contacts butting together like that, make a good connection, they'd just been at a slight angle, so they'd been touching a corner, and that's where it had been burning. Although, having said that, even if they do make perfectly flat, uh, only certain points, it's not going to be uneven, it's not going to be 100% coverage of electrical contact. That's the same with any contacts. Um, that's why some have a self-leveling mechanism. They're a bit sloppy, so they can just mate. That kind of points at the advantages of the old carbon uh, contactor contacts they used to have in the bad old days. However, uh, this one is rated uh, C40, which means it's it's got uh, overcurrent protection as well as the RCD or GFCI. Uh, so it's rated for 40 amps, it's rated with a trip characteristic of C, which uh, means that they can be quite an inrush current. And it's got the two parameters, it's got the uh, 30 milliamp trip for the leakage if it detects an imbalance in the current flowing out and coming back in. Um, but it can, de can detect AC and it can also detect uh, rectified AC, pulsing DC, uh, after it's gone through a rectifier, which is the sort of fault you'd find if a car charger failed and went to the chassis. So if I hold a magnet next to this one, it gives a clue as to the trip mechanism because some of these use a rem magnetic remnants and the, the contact's just held in place just barely by a little hint of magnetism. When that's overridden by the, uh, the detected imbalance picked up through a coil, it causes the imbalance and it just basically trips it magnetically. So even holding a magnet near the front of this as well, it's okay, it's a fairly powerful magnet, it can actually trip it remotely. Interesting to know. Right, stop faffing around, Clive. Open it up, because we want to see what's inside. Right, tell you what. I shall try opening up right now. And if it's going to take too long, because sometimes these little rivets start spinning, then I shall pause, because sometimes they just don't come apart easily. I'm not an expert in opening circuit breakers, but I have opened up quite a few in my time. So my theory about the uh, potential failure of these circuit breakers is the fact that many car chargers uh, have power factor corrected supplies. And I shall show you what I mean by that uh, in a moment. Is this where I inadvertently drill myself? Because uh, they potentially draw, instead of drawing the current as a nice even sine wave, they actually potentially draw it as a series of spikes, and that could actually put a lot more stress in the contacts in these. But I tell you what, let's see if this is going to liberate the truth. These rivets look as though they're popping out the other side. I shall tweeze them out. You can always skip forward if you get bored watching me trying to get rivets out of this breaker. That is the joy of YouTube. When it's working, because it went down earlier today. Globally, it went down. Someone must have unplugged the computer. So let's uh, tweeze these out. I drilled that one. Yes, I have drilled that one out. It's just not liberating so easily. I wonder if this little flap here is anything to do with the uh, RCD tuning, or if it's the to do with the overcurrent tuning. Right, are we going to get anything here? Where's my long nose pliers? That is a pen, that is not a pair of long nose pliers. What if I put pliers in like this and squeeze right? Tell you what, let's get this come latch off. How is this going to come off? It's kind of clipped on. That, 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 that kind of does it. Uh, is this going to work? Yeah, this is going to work. Reverse pliering. This is where everything absolutely pops to bits. It always does. There's no subtle taking apart of these things. Oh, that's very burnt. Yes, that's very burnt. Okay, so here's the trip coil. That's the overcurrent coil. 
here's how it works. Where is a screwdriver to prod that with? There is a screwdriver. So this is a little plunger that can go down. And uh, that, under overcurrent conditions, will go down and it will hit the trip mechanism in there. Let's see if I can actually set that and then trip it. Trip it? Yep, trips it. Where is the thermal? Oh, there's the thermal. So here's the bimetallic strip that detects slow simmering overload. So if I reset this again, yeah, and then I flex that down the way, oh no, it's up the way it goes, it will trip it as well. So that's the bimetallic for slow simmering faults just above the rate of current. And this is the uh, solenoid that effectively just detects those high current peaks. After that, it looks very similar to a fairly standard uh, circuit breaker in here. Let's see if I can set everything back down again and reset that again. I'm, I'm not able to reset. Oh, there we go. So why has that not been making contact? There's something stopping that contact from actually swinging over. Oh, there it goes. It's almost like it rides out the way before popping in. Maybe that's because the plastic's been melting. Right, okay, let's go further. Let's uh, see if the over... Uh, must be the RCD detection bit must be the other side. There's the sense coil for that. And there must be... This must be the module inside that also has the ability to trip that, possibly. Oh, I see it. There's a wee pin here, and it's most likely that when reset, if I hold a magnet close to this, uh, that pin should fly out. Hold on, let's try that. I shall zoom down in this, and we'll see if we can catch that little pin there. So do you see that little plastic pin on the end of the box here, like a little tiny solenoid? Let's hold the magnet near that and see if it, we can make it trip. Did you see it just kick out there? That is the mechanism that trips it when it detects the current imbalance. So if I uh, push that in now, it should reset, and it has, it's latched. Okay, we'll take a close look at that. Oh, it's actually completely removable. That's nice. So it's connected to the sense coil, which has all the current flowing through it, and then it's got uh, a little uh, couple of diodes to cap the voltage usually, and then it's got some capacitors to sort of fine-tune the values and only pass AC perhaps, or I'm not really sure. I shall take a look at that afterwards. But there's two fine wires going into this, and inside here will be, let's see if we can open this. It will be the sort of remnant trip mechanism. Basically that pin will be held in by magnetism. Ooh, unsubtle. Okay, is this glued together? It would be annoying if it was glued. It would be nice if it was just clicked together. I think this is glued. Mm, maybe I'll have to open that afterwards then. Hold on. Let's try stabbing myself. Is this going to come out? Oh, that is going to come out. Ooh, there we go. There we go. There is the classic little mechanism where... You've got a little, uh, here's the coil that is normally held on with remnants. If I just press that, it will pop open, right? So this little coil here, uh, white background for this, this little coil, just there's a magnetic remnants with this finely tuned magnet here. And uh, that just barely holds that shut. And when the coil has enough uh, magnetic field current flowing it to override that, it lets that go and it flies up and it chaps the little plastic pin at the back and that's what triggers the circuit breaker. The current to provide that triggering from is from this. This is the current sense coil and it's basically a little transformer with two turnings uh, of the power current going out and then the cur current coming back in. And if the current's equal, they will counteract each other and there'll be no mag uh, residual magnetic flow in this coil. However, when there's an imbalance, uh, it induces a flow in this uh, core and that induces current into the windings and that then triggers uh, the circuitry and fires that little sonoid. Okay, let's uh, go deeper and see the bit that actually failed down here. That, that's it out now. Now that is well burned.
I'm trying not to sneeze here. I don't think I'm going to succeed in not sneezing. I may sneeze. So here's the sonoid call. There's the contact. How has it been uh, doing? Let's uh, get some uh, magnetism on it. Not magnetism. Let's get some magnification. That's kind of similar. Again, it's kind of almost like something's shorted out of the corner. It's got, a, it's got a pattern in the middle, but then it's got a pattern at the side. Where's the contact itself? It's a very standard circuit breaker type contact, and it's been making contact just at the bottom here. It looks fairly typical of circuit breaker failure, to be honest. And once the heat starts setting, it starts melting the plastic, and ultimately, what was happening there before was it was actually preventing, it was damaging the plastic that holds that contact. This burn here, this little hump, is why it wasn't actually uh, resetting easily. That would probably, the once the plastic melted so much, it would cause problems with that. So it is another contact failure, but right, it's time to it's time to look at my theory here, right? Tell you what, so I'll clear all this stuff out of the way, and I'll bring in my notepad. And I shall zoom out just a tiny bit, because this is a bit too close. And I shall focus on the notepad, and then I shall draw what I think is happening. <clears throat> that's potentially causing failures. It'd be interesting to know if you guys have been experiencing circuit breaker failures in other uh, high current chargers, like uh, forklift truck chargers, I suppose, but mainly electric vehicle chargers, where everything will be crushed and made compact, you know, to fit it into the car. So here's what happens. Normally, in a switch mode power supply, you have the zero volt rail, the AC coming in is actually rectified, and it ends up as a series of humps like that. The humps charge a capacitor up in a normal switch mode power supply so that uh, as the charge, initially it will charge capacitor up to the top and then as the load draws current it will, between the humps that it's being charged it will sink down and then it will get boosted up again and then sink down and boost up again. But that means that the current tends to be drawn fairly central to the square wave. So it's got a terrible power factor because the current is not in sync with the uh, voltage and it just creates this uh, a very sort of peaky current waveform. So how they get round that is, the if this is the full wave rectified sine wave again, so humping up and down, I'll draw three so it doesn't look like I'm drawing breasts or anything suspicious like that. Um, it's humping up and down. What they do is they charge the capacitor to above that, so that even though it's gone through a bridge rectifier, it can't charge, it can't put current directly onto that capacitor indirectly. Then what happens is that an extra circuit with an inductor, which looks just like another little switch mode transformer and a transistor, then pulses a series of spikes across the sine wave. And because uh, it's passing current into that inductor and then releasing it, you tend to get a spike goes up, and that's what actually charges the capacitor to above that level. So the capacitor is being charged by a series of spikes over the full sine wave, but that's the problem. And traditionally, if you just had a, a resistive load, the current would be a nice, perfect, smooth sine wave without those spikes. But in this case, it is a series of very closely spaced spikes. And while it looks as though it's providing good power factor, it is effectively, if you were to zoom in on those, you might find that they're a fairly low mark to space ratio. So that is potentially meaning that if the the charger is drawing 32 amps. It could actually be drawing between 60 to 90 amps on each of these spikes. And I wonder if that's what's causing extra stress and uh, eroding the contacts. Maybe the answer there is circuit breakers specifically de designed for uh, electric vehicles that have much, much bigger contacts. Because th this one, you know, it's typical of the size of contact you'd find in a 40 amp circuit breaker. So maybe it's that spikiness that's doing it. Hmm, don't know. It looks as though it's been mating in a certain area, but then as the contacts uh, melted, it's then actually gone moved to another area. But that would only be after the damage had occurred. But there we go. This uh, copper here is the arc shoot. It, it actually draws the arc to get quenched in this stack of uh, copper plates. They're quite complex little things. It's, you know, you look at how much these cost, which is buttons, really. Uh, and realize that, you know, 
there's a lot in them. Maybe they, maybe they're trying to en engineer them to be too cheap. Oh, they're uh, they look like copper, but they're not. It's a nice, pretty neodymium iron boron magnet ornament. Uh, so there we go. Interesting stuff. Interesting failure mode. And I shall put that link down below if you want to see the full history of this. The circuit breaker being taken out of the charging pillar, uh, which uh, Jordan's covered that in a video. Um, and yeah, right, tell you what, before I go, before I go, I'm going to pause momentarily to take a closer look at this and see if I can reverse engineer it and just doodle it on this notepad. One moment, please. Oh, that is reassuringly simple. Here is the sense coil, right? Sense coil, which picks up the uh, imbalance in the magnetic field in the big choke. This bit here, when the current flowing through the unit isn't matched with the current coming back. Uh, that induces a, a small voltage in that, and to make sure the voltage doesn't get too high and damage the circuitry, it has two inverse parallel diodes across it that basically just shunt that coil out if it gets above 0.6 volts. That then goes to two capacitors to form a sort of, I guess, in a way, a capacitive divider uh, and introduce a small time delay. That one is 33 microfarad. That one is 15 microfarad. And the coil is across that. We're talking very low currents here, I suppose. Um, or are we? Because uh, this is inducing. I'm not really sure how that would go. I'm not sure how much current it would effectively induce in the sense coil if you had that sort of fault current. There's one other thing I missed here, the test button. Where's the, the test resistor? There should be a resistor here that causes a, a current imbalance. I have obviously just misplaced that resistor, or I'm looking right past it. Where is that resistor? Is it sleeved somewhere, or is it actually built in? It might actually be covered with uh, insulation. It might actually be inside one of the wires here. But the idea of that resistor is when you press the test button in the front, it just bridges a little contact out and it passes a fault current through the, the unit uh, that emulates the sort of leakage in this coil. And that then induces the voltage across here. Uh, capacitive divider, which is it's very strange, um, particularly because they look polarised, uh, and that just instantaneously, theoretically, trips the coil. Uh, once the threshold gets up to the point of the, the of defeating the residual magnetism. Uh, I'm kind of like annoyed about misplacing that resistor, or is it actually hidden in here? It could well be hidden in here. The, co the actual of the cables going through it don't look that huge for the amount of current, but I suppose they're realistic enough for a 40 amp circuit breaker. But there we go. That is it. It just looks like a standard circuit breaker failure. I do wonder then if that is down to the odd characteristics of electronic power supplies versus just traditional resistive loads. That pulsing nature may be actually exacerbating the problem and just resulting in premature contact wear. But there we go. Uh, thanks, Jordan, for sending that. It was very interesting. Um, well worth taking apart and exploring. And as I mentioned, I shall link down to uh, Jordan's video down below so you can see the unit that the circuit breaker was taken out of.